If the adults in your life didn't listen to you when you were a kid, if they were neglectful or dismissive or just not physically present, you may find that even as an adult, you often don't feel heard. It's so common for people who had a childhood trauma to go through life feeling disconnected and unimportant to other people. And if you feel that way, you've probably asked yourself whether, you know, the problem is just that you don't feel like people listen or care, but they actually do, or the people in your life are actually making you feel this terrible feeling because I don't know, they're incapable of listening or they think you're not worth hearing or they just don't like you so much that they want to dramatize how much they don't care. Have you ever had this dilemma? You don't know. So it could be just your own anxiety making you think you're not heard, or it could be that people in your life are actually that self-centered. But there's also a third possibility, and that's that maybe you're actually doing something that sabotages your ability to be heard. And for most people, when they're not feeling heard, it's probably a little of each of the three possibilities. So let's talk first about the other people are doing this to me scenario. This definitely happens. Some people really actually are too self-centered to pay attention to other people, to care what they're saying or to pay sufficient attention to understand what they're saying. We all know those kinds of people. Sometimes we've been that person. And if we went through trauma as a kid, there's a pretty good chance that one or both of our parents had some of those, you know, hearing problems at times themselves. They couldn't hear us because either they were drunk or high or depressed or obsessed or, or just too messed up to hear anyone. And a lot of us with unhealed CPTSD have this very unfortunate tendency to collect people like that as friends and partners. And this can range from ordinary non-PTSD relationship dynamics where one person says, hey, I feel like you're not hearing me. And the other person just like, Ugh, you know, rolls their eyes. Or it can be people in your life with a more pronounced problem, people with a personality disorder or an addiction or people with just years and years of resentment. They're passive aggressive or stonewalling where they're literally incapable of being present and taking in what you might be saying. Or we might find ourselves, and this would be true in the early stages of a relationship with an extremely self-centered person, maybe one with narcissistic tendencies where they seem like they pay intense attention to us so wonderfully, but then for no apparent reason, the rug comes out, they don't care about you, they listen to nothing, right? So that's called the discard phase. The days of caring about you are over. And I know a lot of you watching have suffered in relationships like that. And I'm hoping you're at the stage of recovery where you're able to see those red flags now. The too good to be true behavior that comes before they throw you away. And to hold yourself separate from attaching to such people or having expectations of them in any way. Because no good thing ever came from trying to make things work with someone who doesn't care about you. And I talk about this extensively in my online courses and my coaching programs, which if you're interested, you can find them down below in the description section. There's links there in this video and all my videos. But this is a huge way that people with childhood trauma can fall into re-traumatizing themselves by attaching to people despite evidence that they're cold or uninterested or even cruel. Basically, if you're still dating, hooking up with, sleeping with, marrying, attaching to, chasing, texting, pining away for someone who cannot and will not hear you because they don't care, then at least you know that a trauma-driven decision brought you into this relationship and is holding you there. Your decision. Because at this point, when you see what you're dealing with and you don't leave, then that's a decision. And the problem has migrated from their responsibility now to your responsibility. And it's hard, I know, to face this, but this is what a lot of us do when we don't have healing yet. We complain about someone not hearing us, but we keep thinking we can make them change if we can just explain it right or be loving enough or lose some weight or whatever imaginary thing we're blaming ourselves for. We're focusing on the other person changing because we're not able, not yet at this point, to focus where the potential for change really is in ourselves. And I think most people with CPTSD have done this at least once or maybe a whole lot of times, right? But catching yourself doing this is always good news because when you can find a way that you've had a hand in some of the trauma-related struggles you're having, the part that you bring to it, even if it's a small part, is the part you can change. And sometimes that one change can be enough to tip the scales 
and change the way you operate in the world. Change the kind of relationships you form. This is your most direct path toward that warm-hearted, connected feeling that we all want and need. So clinging to someone who is incapable of caring about you is one way that you might be causing yourself to not feel heard or indeed to be heard. Let's talk about the subtler ways though that we might play a role in this. Sometimes we're not heard because of the energy we bring to an interaction or because of the way we're communicating. Let's talk about the communication first. The effects of trauma, especially when we're under pressure, like an argument or when we're upset, can distort or jumble our thoughts and words. Has this ever happened to you? Or have you heard somebody get like this? It's part of brain and emotional dysregulation. And dysregulation is what CPTSD is like made of. It's what it does. It's what drives most of the other symptoms that you might be having after you grew up with abuse and neglect. Now, when you're in this kind of dysregulated state, the urgency of your feelings makes them feel so clear. But in reality, the way your words are coming out isn't clear enough for someone to really hear it. And I know this from experiencing it and coaching hundreds of people with childhood PTSD and listening to their jumbly thoughts and feelings, the mosaic of reactions that are kind of all over the place. They're having trouble sort of landing the point of the sentence that they're saying. And I help them slow down and lay things out in a way another person can understand. In this case, so I can understand what happened, how they feel, what they want to happen now. The feelings might be clear, but they come out like a tsunami, just run on breathless, and desperate. And this is hard for other people to hear. It can be emotionally intense to be on the receiving end of that. And if the person you want to hear you has defenses going up because that intensity is scary for them, guess what? You're not going to be heard. And I'm sure you've been on the receiving end of that and you know how it can feel overwhelming or even threatening or just kind of exhausting when someone's getting all verbally intense on you. You can't think, you can't get a word in edgewise. And when they tell you, you're just not hearing me, you might feel like exasperated already and you just want to give up and flee at that point. You want to leave the room. You want to check out in your mind or do that subtle kind of, you put on a nice face, but close your heart trick where you're like, no, yes, I hear you, sure. <laughs> Sometimes we all have to do that. The good face to make another person feel heard, even while you're thinking, I just, this person is horrible. I need to get out of here, right? And to be honest, sometimes CPTSD makes us horrible. And this is one of the harder to talk about reasons we don't get heard. And it's not just because we're communicating in an intense way, but because we're communicating in an unfair or even hurtful way. Maybe we're being manipulative. Um, remember, we never think we're being manipulative, but if you have a hard time being direct about what you want and you try to kind of dress it up as something you think will be more acceptable to the other person, but you find yourself getting into arguments because you aren't getting what you want, you know, there's a good chance that your communication has got a little smidge or two of manipulation in it. And people will instinctively pull back from that if they have any kind of BS detector at all. Manipulating people through vague complaints or cold silence or guilt trips or fudging the truth or any little ways that you avoid saying directly, hey, I'm feeling lonely or I'm angry or I'm feeling insecure and I want you to stop what you're doing right now and help me for a minute so I can get myself emotionally back on track again. That would be direct communication, but these subtle forms of manipulation where you say something different, like I feel like you just don't like me or care, those are the things that are ultimately gonna make the, the hearing problem worse. So do you ever notice that when you're not real about your feelings, there's absolutely nothing the other person can do to make you feel better? That's the telltale sign that some conflict with someone isn't what it seems. It's a false conflict. And the sign is that no matter what you or they do to fix it or help, you can't. The problem is something else. And it takes honesty to get to that. And even then, what's honest is sometimes that the problem is unsolvable. And so when you're in a long dragged out conflict that's going nowhere and you're not feeling heard, it's going in circles, this is something to ask yourself. Is what I'm trying to express the real, fair and true expression of my feelings? Not trying to punish the other person or exaggerate or minimize or mask feelings and needs that I think are unacceptable? Am I twisting them into something else entirely? Sometimes we just have to be willing to get more fair and honest in this way. 
Now, in reality, a lot of times we manipulate when we don't even know why we feel so unheard or so unloved. And this is often because we're deep in a belief that the bad feeling inside must be caused by the other person. And therefore, they must be the ones to fix it. We're looking for a fix that in reality, no one else can give us. We're in a flashback. The argument we're having is just making it worse. We beg to be understood and comforted. And it helps to know that the other person, you know, they can be supportive, but they can't fix our feelings if it's not theirs. It's not something that they were involved in. It's coming up from some memory we're having. So it's not theirs to give us the fix. This is that hole inside that only our own healing can fill. So part of that takes time. Part of it can start right away. And that's why I teach in my courses, the healing process is not always a straight line. Sometimes pain is the catalyst that makes good changes possible. So where you are now, it's an okay place to start. And it starts with believing that healing is possible and adopting a steady day-to-day -day application of simple common sense steps that will begin to move you out of that triggered dysregulated state so that you can think and breathe and compose your thoughts and make choices. And that's what my courses and coaching programs are all about. Those are linked in the description section if you're ever curious about them. But the fruit of all these positive changes in yourself of getting re-regulated is that you start being and feeling heard. Right at this moment, if you wanna be heard more, bring as much focus as you can away from other people and onto your own symptoms, on your own way of communicating and connecting and how you'd like to change that. It's good to be heard, it's, it's important, and I want you to have that. After all you've been through, you totally deserve the secure, connected, witnessed feeling that comes when your healing process empowers you to have that kind of relationship. If you wanna learn more about communication strategies for people with childhood PTSD, I've got a video lined up for you right here, and I will see you very soon.